Every man has a story to tell, but not every man knows how to tell it. Michael Cooper could tell a story for sure. He didn't with words. Instead, his tales were best told through images of the most notable names of the freewheeling 60s. It wasn't only because of his talent, visual skill, seductive charm, charisma, and endearing personality that summarized his magnificent work. He really was an alchemical presence. Through luck or foresight, he was always there when it mattered. Michael was a unique artist with an obsessive involvement, not only just to record, but to participate, telling everything just like it was. He had not only an innate ability to get inside your head, but also right beyond it. His subjects were, as he said, not just faces I've photographed, but people I've worked with or become involved with on a personal level. They were icons of an era the world will never forget thanks to his talent to capture them like nobody else did. July 1969, the Stones were due to take to the stage at Hyde Park. Brian Jones, the founder of the band, who became a fallen soldier of the times, having passed away two days before the event. As usual, Michael was there capturing greatly what became a memorial to Brian. As an homage, Mick Jagger read verses from Shelley's pastoral elegy, Adonis and along with it, hundreds of white butterflies were released in his honor to fly high into the sky to greet his soul. Michael Cooper was a great artist and a great believer that any form of arts would make this world a better place. His magnificent work confirmed this greatly. Signed, Adam and Sylvia Cooper, Buenos Aires, 2019. It's a lovely, immaculately put together. I looked at the thing and it's really cool. Um, and it's nice, as you say, that it's full of positive energy, that it's not bottom feeding and so forth. And well, what I did, what I did like is I went, I went completely the opposite way to, to others. Is, you know, I spoke to Jane Rose, who's the manager of Keith, for example, and, and I said, told her my intention. You know, I always keep them informed of what I'm up to with anything to do with them. And, and she said, oh, so I suppose you want to talk to Keith about Brian? And I said, actually, no. And she said, oh, really? That's, that's, that's surprising me different. <laughs> and I said, well, <clears throat> with the greatest respect to Mick and Keith and Charlie as well, um, if I start putting in text into this book from them, it's going to draw the attention away from Brian and, and filter it through to them. And th right. I want this book as much as it can be to be about Brian and, and less about them. You know, uh, you can't deny that the pictures in the book have got stones in it, of course, but at the same time, uh, keep the emphasis on Brian. So I went completely the, the other way and I got in touch with uh, Linda Lawrence, who, who gave birth to, to Julian, his first son, um, Jules, who's his uh, grandson, Brian's grandson, um sam cut and these are these sorry to interrupt you these are people who are contributing text yeah they've right? they've all contributed text including donovan who's been married to linda for many years and knew brian very well and i just pitched it's, the whole idea to them about where i wanted to go with this book and and they all loved the concept and and for the first time ever linda agreed to do something for the book and um right. And, and that was my emphasis. And, and I just kept it very personal and kept it as a true statement of the positive side of Brian and didn't touch upon all, all the negatives and all the rumors and the gossip and all the crap that's been printed about him over the years, you know, and it, okay. and it seems to have proved a point. And, and I'm very proud of it. And I'm very happy about that because uh, I've got some fantastic Im images of Brian and Michael and Brian were great friends, and uh, as, as well as Anita. And and I thought, well, you know, I, I really want to make this book full of positive energy and and show the plus side of Brian and the fact that he was the founding member of the Rolling Stones, and the fact that. And this is for the. Sorry to interrupt you. This it was Brian's fiftieth fiftieth uh, anniversary of his passing. 
last yeah, year. Yeah, last, last year. And um, so, so I thought it was So you could put this together and that it's it's out? Let me not yeah, interrupt you. Just it, it's out. It's out as a limited edition, and it, it, you know, I mean, to to my amazement, it sold out within days of its release. You know, it, it, there's not one copy. How yet. many copies? Would... We did a run of three hundred. Okay, a limited so edition. limited, very limited edition. Okay. But I knew, I knew that if it was successful, which it has been, then I would then follow that up, which we're doing right now, is is to produce it into a what they call a trade version, which is just just the book, you know, no slip case and no extras and photos and postcards and all of that stuff, just the book, right. an affordable volume, which will probably mm -hmm. sell for in the region of, let's say, 50 or $60. And that will be okay. distributed around the world for anyone to pick up a copy if they're, if they're into well, it. Thank God for that. I mean, because I'm thinking of like the Exile book. I'd love to have a copy of that. I bet I think it's quite expensive. So, and probably the same. Uh, I don't know what uh, Butterfly in the Park was, but I don't know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pounds, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it's the norm is is that you produce the limited edition, and that's somewhat of a test ground to see how popular it is. Uh, okay. and, and you're aiming towards serious collectors, you know, so. Um, but the, res the, the reaction I've had to the Jones book is that I've been receiving so many messages through social media from people that are really into Brian, and they say, yeah. you know, are you coming out with an affordable trade version because I can't afford to pay for the limited edition? So uh, and, this time and around, we don't know when that might happen. Or well, you know it's, it, it's, it's going to happen later this year. I've got three or four companies that, that want to take it, but it's... Uh, it's in the, okay. the negotiation stage, shall we call it? <laughs> okay. You know, the guy was a musical right. genius. We have to we have to recognise that he was a musical genius, and he founded the the greatest rock and roll band in, in history, um, and picked up an instrument and could play it in five minutes. Brian's downfall was the fact that he lacked tremendously confidence in being able to right. put pen to paper and write lyrics and write music, you know, and um, which was not deterred from him because of Mick and Keith. They didn't dissuade him. They, they encouraged him. But he just didn't, he had something inside of him that just held him back and said, no, I'll leave that to Mick and Keith. You know, I'll just, I'll take care of the instrumental side of things. And, um, and that was Brian. Artists have these different sides. A lot of it is because they're very sensitive. Quite frankly, so they get off into I don't know substance abuse. Yeah, I think I think with Brian, but there's who, still a person there, <laughs> so it's important to you know to, nice to feel that through your book. Yeah, I think the shame of it all, really, to be honest with you, with what you just said, which is absolutely correct. You know, they all creative people have got a sensitive side to them, but I think Brian was, let's say, too sensitive. You know, he he found it difficult to cope with the. Uh, you know, the, the power of the record business. And, um, right. uh, you know, some can cope with it and freely take it on board and deal with it and manipulate it and mould it the way they want it to be. And others, they, they crack. And, you know, Brian brought a lot of baggage with him when he, when he left Cheltenham. You know, he, he, he didn't have a particularly great relationship with his parents and his sister died when he was very young, when she was very young, and that affected him. And, and so when he met with the Stones... But and he Stones, was sort of Jack the Lad in... Chelsea. He was Jack the Lad. And, you know, everyone called him the dandy of London because of his fashion and everything else. And, and he, right. he came across with a very sort of bravado and, and sense of confidence. But it, inwardly, you know, there was right. a lot of suffering going on and uh, a lot of skeletons in the cupboard that he hadn't had the chance to really deal with. And then that in turn affected him with regards to, you know, drug abuse and alcohol and all of that business. And, and you think, I think it's, is it Stash, uh, Prince Stash, who says uh, they they felt that all the pressure from the authorities, you know, that really was kind of too much for him. You know, well, they, I mean, the, you know, the authorities, they, they absolutely pinpointed the, the band, you know, they went after, deliberately went after Keith and Mick and, and Brian, you know, they, they, they saw the power that they had over the younger generation and that they right. 
wanted to stamp it out and 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 put their authority on top of it and uh, you know Mick and Keith cope with it in their own particular way and uh, and Brian dealt with it in his way but it was tremendous right but tremendous there was a rift within the band too so well, that they, he they, probably they, felt they, more and more isolated as, well the problem you know, was is that it after you know, Morocco right? yeah you know well that whole scene with with him and Anita splitting and she running off with Keith and whatever that, that certainly didn't help band relations in any way whatsoever but sure. the, the number one thing for the band was that they were climbing the the ladder of success and they were planning to go back to the states to do another tour which in those days if you didn't crack the states you didn't crack anything you know so right. um and because of brian's drug drug offenses the, the american authorities refused to give him a visa so it meant that he couldn't travel and wow um, i didn't know that Interesting. yeah you know and so you know the band put in this terrible position where where they're one of their main players uh, can't travel with them because of previous offences, and and what year and yet, was that? Do you know? They couldn't walk away from the state, so that you know they had to. They were pushed into this position where they had to say to Brian, you know, it, it, we can't carry on like this. And and of course, on top of all of that, Brian was it was absolutely excessive about you know uh, his drug consumption and his and his alcohol consumption and and was spiraling out of control and and as mick right. said many times you know he'd come to the studio maybe he would maybe he wouldn't when he did he was just completely out of it and he was incapable of doing anything let's go on to uh to your father after your father passed away you who is your father talk about give us his name and what Michael yeah, Cooper, did. and uh, well, he was a photographer. He started at um, Maidstone uh, College of Art, and he was very impressive as as a photographer. So much so that they actually hired him to teach photography to the students, even though he hadn't qualified at that stage. And word got out. I don't know how, but word got out and filtered down to to London and uh, and, and to Vogue House, and um, they took a look at some of his stuff and they really liked it. And literally days after he qualified, he was asked to go to Vogue office and he sat down and they said, "We want to offer you the opportunity as junior star photographer under David Bailey, who is the senior star photographer." And of course, wow. Michael at that time he snapped up the opportunity, but the he 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 was he felt very very restricted because you know he was told where to go, who he was shooting with, how many rolls of film he could shoot, and that mm -hmm. just wasn't him. You know, he wanted to be free and he wanted to be able to go out and do his own thing and shoot the people that he wanted to shoot. How long did he last? At, with Vogue or well about two he, two like, years and then he handed in his resignation and everyone was absolutely astonished because you know in those days if you if you got taken on by Vogue it was like winning the pools you know so he was probably a little bit aware it's a bit dangerous uh, well he was very, very bohemian in, in the sense that you know he he didn't he didn't want to be working to instructions he, he felt it was very important for him to express himself through his photography without restrictions and and then you know once he left he he started getting in with the likes of the stones and and he met with robert fraser who was the first contemporary art dealer in london at the time and and they forged the friendship and the, and the two of them somewhat and associated and opened up the, the studio in flood street just off the off the king's row chelsea manor studios so that what year was that and so fraser and him are kind of getting close Fraser is... Um, that would be around about 1964, 65. Four, okay. Okay, so he opens up his, his studio on Flood Street. Um, uh, do you, is it true also the film Blow Up by Antonioni was actually based on your father? Well, they say that. I've never been able to prove it or not. Not David and, Booth. Um, yeah, I mean that right. wasn't, that wasn't Michael's character at all. He wasn't like that. But um, uh, any quick couple of definitive memories of your dad? I mean, do you, did he like the simple things in life? I find you know, going to the beach or the park or having hanging out, having lunch and stuff like that. 
Any yeah, couple I mean, of lots, memories? Lots of, lots of lunches, lots of dinners. Um, I remember as a kid being extremely impatient, as all children are, uh, spending what felt like hours, but it was probably minutes, sitting outside of his dark room while he was inside in the dark, printing and experimenting with paper and, and, and you know, and he'd get, he'd get to the point with an image where he was satisfied with it and he'd take the print and he'd hang it up on the wall to dry. And mm. typical of Michael, you know, never thought about cataloging anything. He had this big mm -hmm. cardboard box and he just threw the negative into the cardboard box, which eventually turned so into 70,000 images, which is what I received when I was 18 and um, and then began Absolutely. began my task which was to you know dive into the into the box get to a lab wash and clean all the negatives to see what I actually had to play with and, and of course suddenly I was I had gold in my hands you know it was, it was just incredible okay so so that's a fantastic image you know to summarize how you remember your father the sort of not the mad professor, but he's passionate and he's involved and he's doing his thing. At what point did you uh blinds and shutters? I think this is partly dictated by your father, but it's something you undertook or you know, published. Yeah, well I, in, in, in this famous cardboard box that I got, as well as the negatives, there was also a lot of notes that Michael had written over the years and and one of them had a title at the top of the page, Blinds and Shutters, my idea for, for my first photographic book and uh, I read through it and I liked the concept very much and I thought okay uh, this is going to become my homage to him and I hit the streets of London and knocked on all the major trade publishers like Thames and Hudson and you know all the, all the big guys and and they all showed a great interest in the collection but they just wanted to do at that stage they wanted to do a book on the Stones or on the Beatles and and I said, well, that's not the concept okay. of my father. You know, it's... Uh, that that was beyond... They couldn't see his value quite yet. Maybe. Well, because the, the problem was, was that Michael, you know, he, he loved the fact that people knew he was a, a, a photographer of music and the Beatles and the Stones and various other artists like Marianne. But he, that wasn't just him. You know, he was into the arts. He was into culture. He took photographs of Andy Warhol and René Magritte and De Buffet and Duchamp. Uh, it, the list is endless, wow. you know, and uh, right. and that's what he wanted to portray was that this book was like a dropping into all the sections of his collection and putting him out there as that. And it, I, I got very frustrated because it took me like two years to get myself into a position where I felt I was ready to be able to present this book to any publisher. And they were... Was that from editing and text and just... Yeah, you know, and they were all just, you know, let's do a Beatles book and let's do a Stones book. And I said, no, you know, thanks very much. And that's when I get up and walk out the office. And it's just purely right. by luck that I, I went into a, a pub somewhere in the centre of London to have a drink. Mm -hmm. And I bumped into, again, an old friend of Michael's whose name was Mr. Harry Nielsen. And Harry... Oh, the singer? Yeah. And Harry knew me as a kid. And I introduced myself to him and he said, sit down, let's have a drink together. And I told him about what I was trying to do. And he said, no, 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 no. He said, you're, you're, you're wasting your time with all of these guys. The only way you're going to get this book done is to produce it as a limited edition. And I said, limited edition, what's that? Wow. And he said, look, go and see this company. They're based in Guildford. Uh, they're a small company, but they produce some really beautiful work. Go and see Genesis Publications. And I sat down. What was his relationship with Genesis? Well, he'd been involved with them because he was sort of somewhat silently collaborating on, on a book they produced about George Harrison called I, Me and Mine. And... Uh, and Harry was very impressed with the way that they presented the book and the quality of the book and everything else. And he said, you've got to go and see these guys. So I went and, and, and met with them. And finally, I, I came across a small group of people that really understood the concept of what Blinds and Shutters was all about. And then began a long journey of producing it and interviewing over 92 different contributors because Michael wanted the text to be made from the people within the photograph okay 
Okay, and what year did that come out? That was released, well, it's now celebrating 30 years. It was released in 1990. Okay. But it took us seven, okay. seven years to produce it. And um, and for me, in my mind, because, of course, Exile and that book came out and, you know, Dominic was a one is a wonderful photographer and it was an amazing thing. But for me, it seems that Blinds and Shadows, this very circuit, circuitous route of, you know, your father to you getting the legacy to Harry Nielsen and then Genesis. Um, well, it Genesis, seems like that Genesis was kind was, of the first one. Genesis had never done a book like that before. Uh, it was a big risk. I, 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 you know, I acknowledge that. And, uh, Right. And, uh, you know, it was, it was an expensive budget and, it, you know, there wasn't computers and all of that business in those days. So it was all cut and paste and real prints. And, and, and it was an expensive budget in terms of an advance or just in terms of the, the legwork? No, we, know, time we, we never talked stuff. about advances. It was just all the money went into producing the book, you know, and, and you know, I, I got okay. a standard royalty and, and that was that. But okay. uh just you know, okay. just tracking down the ninety-two different contributors was was an arduous uh, task in itself. Okay. So then, at some point, uh, I I guess Dominic and Anita have a similar idea, and they make Exile, the limited edition book. Right. Um, tell us how many are these? Like a thousand limited edition, a thousand. No, uh, Lines and Shutters was was big. It was five thousand copy. Okay, and what were you charging for this? Oh, it was expensive. Uh, collector's I think it piece. was in those days, it was like two hundred ninety-five pounds or something like that. It was expensive, but people bought it okay. because it was very, very special, and they knew it was unique. And uh, you know, we did little things. It was also a collector's piece. Well, it is a collector's piece because you know we have a signature page at the start of the book uh, where we've got a minimum of, of twelve signatures in each copy. And they're all original signatures. There's no, there's no photocopy. There's no, no copying of signatures at all. They're all original. And you know, the, okay. the biggest problem that we had was when we released the book, we had people phoning into Genesis and, and specifying, I want to buy a copy of the book, but I want Andy Warhol's signature, Mick Jagger's signature, and, uh, Keith Richards' signature. <laughs> and eventually, we had to say, look, you get what you get because we can't, you know, define it like that. But the power of the book, just to give you a quick example, was that there was some huge charity telethon going on in, in Holland, and they contacted us and said, would we be prepared to donate a copy of the book? And, and we said, okay, yeah. fine, you know, it's good publicity. So we donated the copy, and they started the telethon, and a book that was valued at 295 uh, was signed by Jagger, signed by Richardson, signed by Andy Warhol, went for $28,000, uh, which was all, all money going to children's charity, which made me feel great. Your father shot the cover of Sgt. Pepper's first. Can you just tell me about that? And uh, Yeah, well, that, that, that came about predominantly because of Robert Fraser, uh, who had a, a gallery in Duke Street in London, the first... A contemporary art gallery and he was bringing in all of these weird and wonderful people like Warhol and Magritte and everything else and Paul McCartney was an avid uh, art collector I still I still believe he is and he loved Magritte big time so he was constantly down at Robert's gallery observing and looking at what Robert was displaying and Paul mentioned to him that they were in the midst of recording Sgt Pepper and they came up with this well, Predominantly, he came up with this concept for the for the album cover, and they they were thinking of going with a uh, a, a Dutch creative artist group called the Fool, of which Robert immediately jumped in and said, "No, no, 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 dear boy, you know you 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 need to do this on a much more professional level, and uh, let me introduce you to a, a photographer that I know very well. His name is Michael Cooper, and let me introduce you to a." A British pop artist called Peter Blake, who's who's very renowned, and uh, see how you get on with them. So, and so they, they 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 met up, and so Peter, know, art director. Sorry, yeah, so he, Peter was the art director. He was the art director, but very quickly became the, the overall designer. Um, and and the and the the concept was was what Peter did, which was very clever, is that he sent 
all of the, the individual beetles uh, an envelope through the post, which just basically had a blank sheet of paper in it. And it said, please list the top 12 personalities from around the world that you would most like to perform in front of. So, of course, this whole diverse list came back. You know, Lenin put Hitler and, and Gandhi and, <laughs> uh, you know, typically controversial of John. Um, and that sort of that sort of formulated into the backdrop behind the, the band standing in front of the flowered floor and, and, and the drum skin and everything else. And they took over Michael's studio okay. for, for like two weeks. And he was the official photographer of the album cover. Great. Wow. Monumental. <laughs> what a what a thing yeah. I don't. I, I don't. In all honesty, I you know, in conversations that I've had with with the likes of Peter and and, and stuff like that, no, none of them actually realised you know the impact that the the, the album as, a, as such and the album cover was going to have. You know, I think that happens very. It's very common. You know, I've worked on a lot of movies where you think you know this is never going to do anything, and and it, it becomes a huge hit. And then you work on another right. movie and you say, this is going to be a huge hit, and it goes straight down the toilet, you know. So it's... Uh, you yeah, can never, every you, song is the... Every last project is the greatest, but uh, only a few of them actually, you know, walk and... Yeah, I mean, it, it's... Um, I mean, the album itself is, is incredible, you know. And if you, if you look at the Beatles and you see where they came from and what they were recording back in the early 60s to what they were doing by the time they split in right. nine. I mean, the transition was just incredible, incredible. Um, to, 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 of course, absolutely. I was the same thing because we all, in our hearts, uh, uh, we would listen to the Beatles all the time, but the Stones were like... A little wilder. Tell me also about this. You gave a shirt or something, a little anecdote about your T-shirt. Yeah, well, in the top uh, right-hand corner of the album cover, there's a doll that's sitting on a chair, and it's, it's, it's wearing a sweater which says, Welcome the Rolling Stones, and that actually belonged to me. And, and Michael sort of uh, nicked it and, and said, you know, I think we'll put this into the cover. And... Because what was going on in those days, if you remember, was that the press were inventing all of this sort of rivalry between the Beatles and the Stones, and that they didn't, they, they had a bad relationship, and you know, blah blah blah. And it just wasn't true. You know, it, it literally was not true. You know, Keith is quoted as saying that they phone them up and say, you know, how's your album coming? You know, when are you going to release? We're going to release in two weeks. Okay, well, we'll hold our album back until you know for a few weeks so we don't clash you know and they had a, a mutual respect for each other but the press is always the typical british press they just wanted to sort of drum up rumors about uh, you know conflict right. and, and, and all of that crap so well i think i think keith also said look that the, the good boy image was taken so we took the other one uh yeah, tell me I mean, about that, what happened to the shirt did, did people someone nick the shirt or did yeah, no, after the shoot, I never saw it again, you know, and, and I've never seen it <laughs> since. So somebody's got it. And, but that's that's kind sure, of perfect. And I'm sure it's probably worth a fortune uh, today. But if you look, if you look right. carefully, if you look carefully at Satanic Majesties, in the in amongst the flowers, you see four oval portraits of the Beatles, and it was their form of communication in in replying through the album cover that all of this crap that the press were coming out with was, was just literally crap. You know, they, they had a mutual respect for each other. And uh, so it was, a, it was yeah. sort of a quasi communication without actually saying it publicly. Do you know what like, I mean? Like the, the Da Vinci code or something. Well, yeah. I mean, if you, Listen, if you look I, at, let... um, if you look at the famous, uh, uh, all you need is love video. They recorded the Beatles recorded in, in the studio You've got Mick and Keith sitting there on the floor with Marianne and they're all participating. So, you know, it just sort of dissolved all of this rubbish that was being created by the British press that there was this intense rivalry and competition between the two most successful bands of, of the moment, you know. Tell, tell me about, I think Michael was at Redlands, but also tell me just about Satanic Majesties. He also shot that. Well, band. Satanic Majesties came about... 
it came about one because of his friendship with the band with the stones and um they were very impressed with the album cover of sergeant pepper and they wanted to do their own version if you want to call it that and it's been compared over many years but of course typical of michael he wanted to take it one step further and he wanted to actually turn it into a a 3D uh, lenta, lenta color uh, cover of which there was only one camera in the world that existed at the time, which was just outside of New York, um, Vermont Studios, I believe it was. Right. And, um, you know, Alan Klein, who was the manager of the band, who was based in New York, said, okay, fine, you know, we, we, we can cover the cost, but you guys are going to basically put this cover together yourselves. There's not going to be a construction team. There's not going to be any assistance. Whatever ideas you've got, you can commit to. But, you know, you, you've got to make it. And um, Michael, typical of Michael, you know, Keith always said he could get us to do things that we would never do for another photographer. So he sent them off shopping to buy the clothes and, and, and buy all the materials that were needed. And they came back to the studio and they took out the saw and the screwdriver and, and everything else and started, started to construct this set. Well, I mean, the other thing also is in those days, it, 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 it was much easier to, to actually get close to them. Now you've got, you know, dozens of red tape to cut through before you even get within a hundred meters of any of them. You know, it's, uh, it, it's all changed now. Sure. And, and what, in all honesty, everything changed the day that Paul John was, was murdered because everyone then realized I've got to protect myself because there could be some lunatic out there that's looking to take my life, you know. So it's right. It's, the it's, whole, the whole protective thing. Well, yeah. look, let me ask you because I kind of the, um, there was a, there was a kind of a sweet trip, you guys, because they came by Nelcord. We were at Nelcord. Uh, Mum passed away, I guess, two years before your dad. Uh, it was a mix, you know, the best of times, the worst of times, all that sort of, uh, it was really an amazing time. Um, but your dad came through and shot a, you know, obviously Dominic was there, but he shot some beautiful pics, I think just for a day or two. Right. And then you guys went down to Italy to, I think, Roman Polanski. He shot, a, I think, stills, is that right? Yeah, he was it. the official stills photographer on a film called What? with uh, Marcello Mastriani which uh, okay. another one of those projects that went straight down the toilet. <laughs> but, uh, it was yeah, fun for I mean, you, but it, it wasn't, you was not well. No, it was a fantastic uh, experience for me as a kid, you know, uh, living in Rome and then going down to the Mediterranean and being in Positano, you know, it was like a dream come true. But, but Michael was suffering terribly because Roman, you know, it was only a couple of years after all the horrific Manson murders and everything else. And he'd lost his beautiful wife, Sharon. And, um, uh, you know, he was, he was a very young, young and angry man. And he lashed out, you know, consistently every day, not necessarily towards Michael all the time, but Michael was on the receiving right. end. So it wasn't a, a particularly happy experience for him, but uh, you know the ultimate professional. He, he gritted his teeth and he made it through to the end of the movie. But and you, you know by the time that that period came around, you know the seventy one, seventy two, everyone started to realise. Not me, of course, and, or you, because we were pretty much too young. But the the dream was over. Paul Michael, I think it was a culmination of a, of a lot of different events that took place and and me losing and him losing what I termed as my stepmother, a, a woman called Ginger, two years before that uh, because of drugs right. and all of that business. You know, it, it was like uh, the eternal tragedies were all coming to the front. And, um, and as Keith has said many right. times, you know, uh, a lot of us have survived it and uh, a lot of people fell by the wayside, you know, because they didn't have the, the management and the protection that the Stones right. had, you know. 